Good evening, Bahamas. Coming up tonight. Employees under the PAJ brace for delayed overtime payments. Officials face several challenges with road repairs here in New Providence. news is brought to you by Alive. In best. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Kyle Joaquin. The unemployment numbers are out and they show that unemployment in the country is up from 10 percent in May of 2018 to 10.7 percent. The numbers are based on the preliminary results of a labor force survey conducted last November. Jasmine Brown has the breakdown. According to those statistics, while employment rose between November 2017 and November 2018 by 6,830 people, or 3.4 percent, it was not enough to stop the unemployment rate from increasing. Acting Director of the Department of Statistics, Leona Wilson, explains. The unemployed is increasing at a higher rate because a smaller amount of them, so that same amount, would cause a higher rate of increase. According to the survey, as of November 2018, there were 25,135 people in the unemployed labor force, while there are 210,560 people in the employed labor force. The results of the labor force survey provided information on the labor force during the period of November 2018. 3,500 people were surveyed. While employment was up overall, two of the three most populated islands surveyed experienced decreases in unemployment and one an increase. The results show that unemployment stood at 11.9 percent on Grand Bahama and 7.7 percent on Abaco. Senior statistician Cipriano Winters. On the other hand, New Providence's unemployment rate increased from 10.1 percent in May to 11 percent. The results also showed that at the time of the survey, women were more likely to be unemployed than men. The statistics show that overall the unemployment rate for women reached 11.3 percent in November compared to 10 percent for men. Young women, those aged 15 to 24, and core age women, those aged 25 to 54, were more likely to be unemployed than their male counterparts. By contrast, Men aged 55 years and over were slightly more likely to be unemployed when compared with women in their same age cohorts. Officials at the department say a more detailed report is expected in May. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Well, according to the Department of Labor's recent survey, women are likely to be unemployed more than men. In fact, youth unemployment for women was the highest recorded for all age groups, standing at a whopping 24.1 percent. While those statistics are shocking for some who say the job landscape seems to tell a different tale. Jillian Gray has that. According to the Department of Labor's recent survey, women are more likely to be unemployed than men. In fact, youth unemployment for women was the highest recorded for all age groups, standing at a whopping 24.1 percent. While those statistics are shocking for some residents who say the job landscape seems to tell a different tale. Talking to me because we're a service industry and then, of course, banking is one of the top and I feel like banking and finance is dominated by females. I think uh, more females are being hired more than males. Do you find that statistic shocking? It's shocking, very shocking. According to the Department of Labor's Labor Force survey, the unemployment rate for women reached 11.3 percent in November compared to 10 percent for men. Or to reassure up, those numbers are not shocking, but rather allude to a prevailing cultural stigma in the workplace. I find that the Bahamian culture is a bit patriarchal in some cases, and then it may be an industry thing. Some people may trust um, men in certain areas rather than, you know, females. Sturb said when she was unemployed, she was lucky to have family members who could provide her with the basic necessities like food. And as the cost of living continues to rise, Christopher Wallace says he sympathizes with those who are out of work. When I was unemployed, it's just very hard to do normal things. And, you know, I'm lucky enough to have family who are able to help me out and feed me if I needed it, things like that. So. 
some people aren't as blessed and it's very unfortunate. Making ends meet is as basically all you're doing, and in, especially in a two-family home. Uh, in single-family homes, it's even worse, you know, because I am married, my wife is working, I am working, and it's still, it's still hard sometimes. This business owner, who wished to remain anonymous, said he has had an ad in the newspaper for weeks, but few have applied, and those who did simply did not qualify for the job. He insists that there are jobs to be found, and had this message for discouraged workers. And if we reach that stage that you have that downfall, attitude and mind, you will never help yourself, you know. You get knocked down, get up and go, man. Just don't, don't just lay there and say, I can't move, I give up. Get up and go. Job is out there. Now, while the number of discouraged workers increased in Abaco, those survey numbers showed a decrease in discouraged workers in Grand Bahama and New Providence. Reporting for our news, I'm Jillian Gray. Right, thanks, Jillian. Well, the Ministry of Public Works running into a few challenges with roadworks here in the capital. Some of those challenges include consultation and budgeting issues. George O'Bain sat down with the minister and his team. Officials here at the Ministry of Work says they have run into several challenges when it comes to the continued roadworks, including fires and equipment failure. But according to the Minister Desmond Bannister, the bottom line is they're going to need more money to continue. Bannister revealed that they have already used 100% of the funds set aside for Family Island Roadworks for this fiscal year and have already used 60% of the monies allocated for roadworks here in New Providence. The budget for the Family Islands was $20 million, $10 million for New Providence and $9 million for Bahamics. We need a lot more money, but um, that's not something that I want to discuss publicly. We'll, uh, we'll see what the country can afford. And as the full country can afford, we're going to do the work. Um, we still don't have the capacity that we'd like to have, but as you can see, we have outstanding people who are behind the planning process and making things happen in the country. And so as we get funding, the, I think in the family islands, we've, we've spent all the money that we have, um, and, uh, and we, still, we still have a lot of work, and we spent most of our money in New Providence. And you can see the difference. Uh, when you have 30-year-old roads, uh, it's absolutely critical for us to be able to modernize the road network. Ryan Ramming, general manager of Bahamix, the company contracted to lay the asphalt, says the company has run into several challenges, including fires, equipment failure, and an outdated asphalt plant. There has been increased deterioration of the asphalt plant that we use to manufacture asphalt. Another challenge faced by officials has been working with the utility companies. What we worked on in 2018 was working with all of the utility corporations to ensure that any work that they needed to be done was done prior to us commencing the paving. And so, whereas it may seem as though road works were delayed, we had to make sure that every um, utility company did what they had to do before we started. Because the last thing we wanted to do was to pave a road and then have them go back and dig it up to do some um, works. The ministry has come up with a WhatsApp hotline to assist with the road repairs. And the good thing about having the, the WhatsApp hotline is that um, once um, the motoring public or a res somebody in a residential area uh, want to make a complaint, they can send uh, the location directly to us and then we can um, program the, the repair of those potholes. And so again, let me just give you the uh, hotline for the, the WhatsApp hotline, 3760936. Reporting for our news, I'm Giorgio Bain. Thanks, Giorgio. Health Minister Dr. Dwayne Sands is responding to a leaked Public Hospitals Authority memo outlining financial challenges that will impact overtime payments for some in the public health care sector. Jared Higgs has more. What can I say? It's a leaked document from the Public Hospital Authority. It was intended to be an internal document. Leaked documents now form a major part of the national discussion, but it makes it very challenging to run an organization. That leaked PHA document, authored by Deputy Managing Director Lerone Burroughs, revealed that the public corporation is, in some areas, $2 million over budget. And starting next month and until further notice, all approved overtime will be paid subject to availability of funding. I think you've heard me say it over and over and over and over and over that the Public Hospital Authority 
uh, expenditure relative to its budget, it doesn't match. The document also acknowledged that overtime incurred in December 2018 would be paid during the January 2019 pay package. However, it goes on to say, PHA continues to find itself in a precarious financial position, which is further compounded by the significant levels of additional costs placed upon it by the substantial levels of overtime and sessional pay incurred across all institutions and agencies of the organization. The letter also adds that the curtailing of costs will allow the redirecting of funding into areas where it is sorely needed. The challenges in dialysis and the waiting times in the emergency room and the problem with staffing and repairs to wards and rebuilding wards that are out of commission. They basically all come down to revenue. The document also calls for a significantly higher level of scrutiny to be carried out by executive and senior management when approving overtime and sessional pay. While hospital administrators, financial controllers and other key senior staff will all be required to demonstrate a greater level of responsibility in managing the process. Asks how delayed overtime payments may impact operations. San says it's too soon to tell. We're now having a hypothetical conversation about a what if when um, this is based on a, an internal memo advising of options for a particular strategy. To start to make decisions based on a document that you should never have seen in the first place it's a bit premature. Sands was also asked whether the public corporation would need more than $216 million in the 2019-2020 budget. Here's what he responded. Honesty and candor. And what we have to do, I've said that the public now owes the public hospital authority almost a billion dollars in unpaid bills. A billion dollars. 87% of people who come to the public hospital authority do not pay anything. Nothing. And yet, we turn around and say, oh, uh, I needed to get a certain antibiotic and they ran out. Or uh, I was unhappy with the level of cleanliness in a particular ward, and on and on and on. You can't have it both ways. Reporting for the Guardian News Network, I'm Jared Higgs. Thanks, Jared. Well, two documentaries on a failed festival planned for Exuma have the world talking tonight. In them, numerous names and positions are dropped, and now many are calling for an explanation from several public officials. All these models, like, in the Bahamas. The most insane festival the world has ever seen. The two documentaries aired on streaming platforms Hulu and Netflix dug deeper into the doomed event known as the Fire Festival. There's mattresses all over the place getting soaked. The save yourself mode kicked in. Right, it's a free for all. Since their premieres last week, the internet has been abuzz with commentary, both heated reaction to the revelations and interviews, as well as sympathy for the Bahamans who took a loss. And it all stems from one man, 28-year-old Billy McFarlane, who's now a convicted felon after being charged with defrauding investors of $27 million. Those eager ticket holders expected a weekend of partying with influencers on a private island, but instead got disaster tents and wet mattresses, not to mention the sliced cheese and bread with lettuce. Tickets for the festival were available for up to $75,000. But it's the content of the documentaries that have raised quite a few eyebrows, like a portion from this man, Andy King, a producer of the festival who said he was asked to perform a sexual favor to clear their water from the Bahamas' customs department. And I got back, and I had all the water that we needed. <laughs> Can you imagine? All of our attempts to reach officials at the customs department failed. But interviewees in both documentaries didn't hesitate to drop titles, including the then Minister of Tourism and the head of the University of the Bahamas. In a statement sent out Monday afternoon, UB refuted, saying, The president of the university was not directly or indirectly involved in any communication regarding the organization of the infamous Fire Festival. The statement referencing the president is false and is categorically denied. According to that statement, the university is being advised on the appropriate... Someone took our, our room. Um, they told us that it was a free-for-all. So we have nowhere to stay? Nowhere to stay. Some people are missing bags. It's, We're just it's trying to get our bags. pitch black out. There's, there's trucks. Craziness going on everywhere. Nobody knows what to do. All the resorts nearby are sold out. It's, it's, it's an actual disaster. But one person who appears to have gotten away unscathed, American rapper Ja Rule, who was seen during the earlier stages promoting the festival, along with McFarland. 
The rapper took to Twitter over the weekend seeking to clear his name after people began questioning why he wasn't interviewed for either of the documentaries or at least held accountable. He said, I too was hustled, scammed, bamboozled, hoodwinked, led astray. One Twitter user then asked him, did you lose money? To which he responded, plenty. And after a while of tweeting and catching the heat, Ja Rule said, y'all need Jesus. But there are many questions that need answers, like what role, if any, government agencies played in facilitating the festival. Former tourism minister Obi Wolscombe has already come out telling the Nassau Guardian his ministry did not drop the ball. Now, there has been one bit of positivity that has come out of all of this. The interview of Marianne Roll, an Exuma businesswoman who said she lost 50000 in savings for catering the failed event, well, that has since caught the right eyes, and to date, over $100,000 has been raised for her on GoFundMe.com. Still to come on our news, how many people stopped looking for jobs in 2018? Plus, the health minister on the possibility of a potential dengue fever outbreak. Stay tuned.